you go to play at an opposing stadium and they're on you from like the yeah. opening uh, kick to like the end of the game and you know you got to respect that you hate it when you're a player but you definitely got to respect that yeah i think a lot of people that aren't familiar with the cfl they'll think like maybe like the fan engagement isn't quite there but i mean oh. when you get to places like saskatchewan or hamilton or, or even like Edmonton, yeah. right it's like a college football yeah. atmosphere a hundred percent. You go to the right place, man, and you'll be hooked. Oh, a hundred percent. Anyways, man, we're uh, obviously here to discuss a bit about the mental side of football. I wanted to get a sense, though, you know, growing up in Mississauga, I know you attended St. Joseph's. Back yep. then, did you have any idea of how much the mental side of football meant? And was that something you were working on as you were growing up, or was it not until later in your career? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and you know, back then when you're a kid or, you know, in high school, you're just, you know, you're just really going out and playing. And it's not until, you know, you reach higher levels and everyone is, is you know, on, a, on the even playing field and everyone is just as talented as you were. You start to, you know, investigate ways where you can get an upper hand or, or ways that you can increase, you know, whatever you're putting out. So it wasn't until I got a lot older where I started thinking about, you know, the mental side um, of the game. Uh, just even within myself, um, figuring out why uh, some of the, you know, sometimes I'm thinking certain thoughts or why I'm feeling a certain way before a game or, you know, just thinking about things that have to do with the mental and not physical. Uh, it wasn't until I got a lot older and, and trying to figure out how to, you know, get better and see all the little ways I could get better. Yeah, yeah. Back then as a, you know, a younger kid, so to say, were there anything mentally that you were struggling with whether it was dealing with pressure because it's such a unique time for an athlete when you're in high school that that's when you start to get a lot of you know i guess media attention or scouts are coming to see you there could be a lot of pressure on a kid's shoulders right is that something you felt as well yeah no not really when i was a kid um honestly i love football so much just just getting out there with my friends uh that just having fun with my friends was enough for me like i never really felt pressure when I was a kid it wasn't until um it was time to you know start to get scholarship offers or start to get recruiting is when I started to feel pressure and it was never pressure on the field it was just pressure to uh you know kind of reach my dreams or because it's, it's not it's in your hands to a certain extent but you need the right scouts you need the right coaches to see you know what you're putting out and, and then you know obviously offer you a scholarship or give you an opportunity at a school so um, it was never pressure on the field. It was just, uh, it was just pressure when it was off the field and dealing yeah. with the, the kind of the business side and, and stuff like that, because, you know, you never know how it's going to go. You never know how someone's going to view you. You never know, you know, how, uh, you know, each guy is going to see your game or how your game is going to fit. So, you know, you hold, you obviously hope for the best, but that was the only pressure I felt because, you know, obviously every, every kid has a dream to play you know, at the next level. And, you know, when it's in someone else's hands, that yeah. kind of adds a little bit more pressure though. So that's the yeah. only pressure I felt. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about getting scholarship offers. Walk me through a bit your time at, uh, it was a junior college there. You played in San Francisco. Walk yeah. me through a bit so about your time college. there, because I think for a lot of people, they, they don't have that same determination mindset that you had in order to keep grinding there. And eventually, you know, got to Buffalo and now to the CFL. So just walk me through a bit about just your whole mentality through that situation. Yeah, so that was, you know, definitely an interesting time, you know, coming out of Canada, coming out of, uh, you know, a great high school season. Um, I wasn't getting a lot of attention down south, and that was what I was looking for. Um, I knew that was my goal. I knew that was my dream to play in the States, to play Division One football. And, you know, one of after, you know, my senior high school season, my one of my best friends, uh, who's a scout for the Miami Dolphins, he was like, man, like, we got to do something. He was also my teammate, so... He was uh, he was sending out emails to you know all the schools possible. My how he made a highlight film, sending that out to you know every school possible, and uh, you know wasn't getting a lot of traction. So he was like he he did some research and he figured out that you know a lot of guys you know go the junior college route once they're not getting and it was past the time I could go to prep school. So the next step was the junior college step. So he he did the research, found out that the best junior colleges. Uh, <laughs> available. Um, San Francisco was one of them. Um, and thankfully enough, they were one of the first schools to, to reach back out to me and tell me they liked my film and, and wanted to bring me in and give me an opportunity. So that, that, that's how that process started. And yeah. even when I got there, uh, it was, it was like a, a shock, shell shock kind of 
you know, environment because you're dealing with some of the best football players, some of the best football players that went to D1 school and then came back, um, you know, for whatever reason, to try to get more, more playing time, more exposure, for whatever reason, they came back. So you're dealing with some of the best players. And then adding on the fact that I'm coming from Canada yeah. and I'm not used to this kind of speed. I'm not used to this kind of technique. I'm not used to this kind of intensity. And it, it was just, it, I, I remember it vividly. It was just my first practice. I'm like, this is something else. <laughs> and, uh, and I knew from then I, I knew I had to get better because yeah. uh, what I had wasn't good enough at the moment. So, you know, it took a, about a year for me to adjust, man. And, you know, my second year, uh, was one of the top receivers in the country and then started getting offers from, uh, division one schools. But it was, it was definitely a, a learning experience. Um, and it, that junior college experience definitely shaped me into, uh, you know, the kind of player and yeah. man I am today. I think, you know, for any athlete, it's tough leaving home. And for a lot of people, they look at your situation where you left home from the Toronto area to San Francisco to go play junior college football. Like that's, that's pretty crazy. You only really do that. I think if you really truly love football and you really believe in yourself, but looking at things off the field was moving away from home and kind of that homesickness feeling Did it ever play a part in your journey to San Francisco. Was that something you thought about or was it really just hundred percent about football and you're going to do whatever it had to take to get to the next step? Yeah, you know, I think there's a bit of both of that in, in, in play because, you know, you know, you're away from your friends, your family, your comfort zone, you're in a whole new environment. But, you know, for me, I, I you know, you make friends, you know, you meet people who are away from home as well, and you kind of form bonds and, 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 and friendships that kind of life will last a lifetime because you're all going through the, through the same thing. So I've got friends in the San Francisco area yeah. and mentors in that area that I still connect with still to this day. I consider them a family. Um, I visit them like every, every few years I go back and visit. So I think at that point it was, it was a homesickness at first a little bit, but once you get to know people and once you get to form bonds and then, you know, you're playing football at the same time and, you know, some of that goes away, but, um, there's definitely a little bit of both where there is homesickness. You miss your friends and family, but mm-hmm. there's, there's a job that needs to be done. There's a task at hand that needs to be done. And, you know, the, ultimately the, the dream, it trumps everything. So whether you're feeling homesickness or you're feeling, you know, um, like you want to go home, like if, if that dream is important to you, you know, you're not going to let anything get in the way. Yeah, it's all about, you know, I think for, for professional athletes, there's a certain degree of sacrifice that comes into getting where you are. And looking back, if, if you knew, you know, leaving home, you end up going to the CFL, you make that decision 10 times out of 10, right? It's, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's tough in that situation because it's a bit uncertain, like their future is not guaranteed. So I think that's where a bit of the, the wrestling in the mind kind of comes into play. At, uh, at San Francisco, obviously you killed it there and I'm getting some D1 looks, um, but some kind of coaching changes kind of got in your way at different schools that were looking at you and ended up in Buffalo. But being an athlete and being recruited by colleges and then there's coaching changes, that's something that's really out of your control and you have no control over it, right? How do you yeah, wrestle with that or how do you come to terms with that in the moment as things are happening around you and you can't change it at all? Dude, that was that was some of the toughest moments in, and, uh, and that I had to ever go through because you feel like you're so close. Like it happened, that might happen to me like three times where I'm getting close. I think the first time it happened was when uh, Temple was recruiting me and uh, Al Golden was the coach there. And they're recruiting me. We're setting everything up. I'm supposed to go visit. They like me. Um, potentially going to offer. Uh, they're literally getting my flight information. And then the next thing I, I read on ESPN, Al Golden accepted a job at University of Miami. And I'm like, what? Okay, so what does that mean for my uh, for my scholarship or my the, the visit I'm about to take? I uh, contact the coaches. They're like, man, we don't even know if we have jobs. We don't know if we're going to be back. So that was tough for me. So then that obviously dried up. Um, then I was supposed to go to University of Hawaii, um, take a visit there. Um, then Coach Mack gets, I don't know if he fired or he retired. He Something happens with him. It's been so long. And then he uh, he's not there anymore. And then that dries up. Um, San Diego State was a, was a destination I was supposed to go to. And because all these things uh, end up happening. But, you know, at the same time, you look at it and in the moment you're devastated. Like, I was devastated. I'm like, this is unbelievable. How does this keep happening? But, you know, you you, you have no choice but, you know, to go back to the, what, what's your dream? Like, what do you want to accomplish? And you look at the dream and 
there was no giving up. There was no, oh, let's just come back home and, and call it quits. You just, you know, got to gotta keep pulling forward. And obviously, uh, I was thankful enough to get the opportunity at University of Buffalo. And uh, it was generally happy when that I finally fell through yeah. and, and happened. And I was like, I can finally breathe a sigh of relief because there was so much that had gone on before um, before it actually happened. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's yeah. It's tough, man. It was devastating in the moment for sure. I'm a, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. And I think in the moment when you're in a situation like that, it's like, it seems like the world's falling in front of your eyes. Right. And, and there's, it's the end of the 100%. world kind of thing. But looking back, I'm sure given everything that's gone on, you've been put in certain situations where you've grown as a football player and as a person as well. And you know, everything happens for a reason. And every, every time there's a negative situation, there's always a positive that comes out of it. A hundred percent. At um at Buffalo, I mean, I know 2012 you had some time on the field. In 2013, you're starting to get more playing time, and you had a broken was it your broken ankle you had? And yeah, you're out for the ankle. season. Yeah, injuries. I mean, I think with athletics, especially football, injuries is is such a you know it's almost inevitable. But when you have such a major injury like that, it can really damage an athlete's psyche. And for me personally, when I go through injuries, it's, it's the absolute worst. And I still can't even have a strong mindset towards them because there's nothing worse than being on the sideline and see your teammates on the field. Walk me through a bit, you know, how you kind of overcame that mental adversity of, of having a season-long injury. Because I think that's one of the key aspects of a lot of professional athletes is overcoming that season-long injury. It toughens you up so that you can tackle a lot of things better. Yeah, man, like injury is probably the worst thing, uh, you know, the athlete can go through, like you said. But like uh, you also mentioned, like you, you can learn a lot about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can learn how to deal with adversity. So it, these are all just building blocks that you go through and you realize you become a better person. But for me personally, those injuries were devastating because, you know, I was, that happened, my ankle happened my last year of college. And I'm thinking, I, you don't get another last year. This is the only last year you get. So to have that injury happen at that time was, uh, once again, it was devastating. I was, I was, man, I would say I was depressed for, you know, a long period of time. Just knowing that, like, my dream was to play um, college football, you know, D1. And I was starting to get that opportunity. You know, my first year transferring there from uh, junior college, you know, learning the system, you know, having, you know, seniors ahead of me, didn't get that much playing time. But, you no, know, my second year was when, you know, kind of where it was supposed to happen, you know, was starting, um, things were going for me, well for me, and, and I was supposed to make an impact on the field. And everything was going good until you get hurt. And you're thinking, right now, this is going to happen right yeah. now? Are you serious? So, you know, you go through, you know, learning that, you you know, your season's over, you know, that is a, is a grieving process in itself. Then... Um, realizing that you're never going to have an opportunity to make the kind of impact that you want to make. That's another thing you got to get over. And then, uh, then ultimately, like, in the moment, I felt like I let a lot of people down. Even though I know I didn't, and they all told me they were proud of me still, I wanted you know, the kids back in my hometown to be like, yo, to use me as an example as someone that, you know, they can look to for inspiration. I just felt like I was letting a lot of them down. And it was something that, you know, obviously was out of my control, but I couldn't help but feel like that. So, mm -hmm. honestly, it was a tough time. The, you know, sports is so many ups and downs that you go through. And that's why, like, the ups feel so great. And you see guys, you know, when they win a championship, they're, they're crying. And you see the, the emotion coming on their face because, you know, you go through so much in the athlete that a lot of people don't get to see. Like, I don't know if I've ever told anyone all this I'm sharing with you. But a lot of people don't know that. But then, you know, you see me score a touchdown. And, you you know, you think it's just that. And it's just that all the time. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, uh, that's why I appreciate your show because, you know, you get into the mental side and that's a big, uh, great focus. But honestly, the injuries, man, that, that hurt me a lot. Um, but like I said, like I'm where I'm at for a reason. Everything does happen for a reason. And uh, obviously I was able to overcome that and uh, get to where I'm at now. Uh, but I wouldn't wish injuries on anyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What you touched on there was pretty similar. I, when I talked to uh, to Gino a couple episodes ago, Gino Lewis on the Alouettes, we talked about yeah. how um, you know you see an athlete or a football player score a touchdown on TV, right? And people will look at it and be like, "That's what I want. I want to be a football player." 
they see that yeah. 10 seconds of him catching a football in that zone. What they don't see is a 24 seven hour grind that goes on behind oh, yeah. the scenes. Right. And, oh, yeah. and it's not all, it's not all rainbows and roses behind the scenes either for an athlete. And, and there's a lot, a lot of blood, sweat and tears that go on in order to get to the point where you see that 10 second touchdown on TV or that TSN highlight of the day. Exactly. Just like, you know, the Olympics, like Usain Bolt, everybody sees him running 10 seconds, right? Breaking the yeah. world record, right? But behind those 10 seconds is literally 10 years of work, 10 years of blood, sweat, and tears, 10 years of injuries, of doubts, ups and downs, 10 years of stuff that no one ever gets to see. But you see that 10 seconds, and it goes by so quick. And you think, man, that, that's great. I want to be that. But what you don't see is everything behind the scenes and, yeah. and uh, everything we just talked about. So yeah. it's great that you know, he mentioned that because that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. CFL draft comes along and Argos trade a couple of picks to select you. As an athlete, is that something that you're conscious about when you're playing? Like, do you feel any added pressure when a team trades up to get you? Or is that something that you are able to kind of block out and not care too much about? Uh, in the moment, that was that. I don't know if I even noticed that they did that. Honestly, I was watching the draft, and like, like I said, that friend that I told you was helping me get uh, into D1 schools and writing emails and stuff. Uh, he was actually on the staff of the Toronto Argonauts, so he calls me and uh, tells me that, uh, hey, our GM wants to talk to you. We're gonna pick you, man. <laughs> and then I'm like, I just lost it. I didn't know who they traded, what they traded. What was happening? I just knew I was on my hometown yeah. team. So after that, I, I don't know what happened. I just I probably blacked <laughs> out a couple of times yeah. with the excitement, and, you know. And then my phone blew up. Um, everybody was calling, texting me. Our phone probably froze uh, like three times that day. So no, it was. Yeah. I didn't even know this was happening. Then when I got the, the chance to sit back and actually see that they had traded up to get me, I was like, okay, it makes me feel like they really wanted me. Like when you're getting drafted, you feel like a team wants you. But when they trade picks, you know, you, you know that you're, you, I didn't just fall to them. Like, it was a plan. It was strategic. I, I, they really wanted me in that spot. And, you know, we're able to do some things and put some value behind actually picking me and, and, and giving away some assets. So you feel good. You feel good anyway getting drafted. But when they do that, you feel even even even, even doubly as good because you know that it was a planned, uh, a planned action. And it means so much because it's your hometown team and you, and you had a couple of seasons there in Toronto and then you left to go to Edmonton. Tell me, you know, how hard it was to leave Toronto, getting the chance to play for your hometown team. And now you're going out West. I mean, I know it's still football and you're happy to play football and, and, you know, uh, thankful for the journey and everything, but I have to imagine it might sting a little bit to, to leave your hometown team and go out West. Man, it was, it was a hard decision. Because obviously, you know, you get drafted by your hometown team, you're excited, uh, you know, you're happy, you're home, everything's all gravy. But then once football starts and, you know, you're a rookie, you're not playing much, uh, you know, you're learning, you're kind of learning the ropes, you're happy to be there, you're happy to be learning and everything that goes on. But then my second year comes, you know, playing a little bit, but I just, at the, time, the point I was in in my career, I, I, you know, was analytical about it. I didn't see... Uh, myself getting a lot of playing time in Toronto just because of our structure of our team. We had a lot of we had a lot of great players, you know, that that were you know at the receiver position, Canadian receiver position. I was like, you know, I might have to go elsewhere, you know, to really showcase my talents. And if I'm ever going to play, I have to go elsewhere or maybe washed out the league in a, in a couple of years, like you see with some guys. And I didn't want that to be me. And you know, with with that in mind, I was like, I have to go somewhere else because mm-hmm. either I stay here and get washed out. Or I go somewhere else and and maybe find a role and maybe may, maybe make something of myself maybe you know reach my potential so that was that was the two options going through my head it was so hard man because you know leaving home is hard uh, especially when you know it's your choice you know if anyone has a choice they'll stay home but for the greater good of my career uh, I had to leave and when when that was at stake when it was either play football for a while or play for a couple of years. Uh, the, the the choice was ultimately easy, but emotionally it was it was it was difficult. Yeah. It was also difficult because at that time I was I was due to have my first child, and that that even made it even more hard. But my wife was you know so supportive. She was like you know I know this is your dream, and if, if that's what's at stake, you need to you need to continue to you know you need to do what's best for yourself. And you know she put me ahead of you know obviously the family and you know obviously 
that's why she's my wife yeah. <laughs> and everything. But no, that's honestly, I, I, I thank her all the time for that because, you know, that decision wasn't easy for the family. You know, she'd have to be staying home for, you know, like six months at a time, right? While yeah. I'm there living my dream. But, you know, so it's, it wasn't an easy decision. It was tough on so many levels, man. But, you know, it, it was a decision I felt had to be made. And uh, looking back, it was the right decision. It was. Even yeah. at the time, I felt like it was the right decision. Yeah, it obviously was the right decision. And in the, just this past year, you had kind of a breakout season there with the Eskies. Um, talk, talk to me a bit about, did anything feel different this year than years prior as to why you had a breakout season? Like, did you knew early on this is how the season would play out? And maybe speak a bit about your relationship with Trevor and how that kind of played a role in your breakout season as well. Um, so this year, I honestly, physically... Uh, same guy I've been since probably my, my second year, physically same guy, mentally a lot more mature. Um, not just this season, but after my couple of years in Edmonton, I grew a lot going to, uh, no, um, in Toronto, I grew a lot going to Edmonton and just realizing that, you know, you have to, you know, to make it in this league, man, you have to pay your dues, but you also have to, if you're a backup receiver, man, you have to know every single receiver spot, you know, just little things like that you know, made me grow, made me understand the game a little bit more. So I was putting more time into the mental aspect of the game, uh, more so than the physical, because the physical is there. You know, everyone, you know, a great athlete, you know what I mean? But what's going to set you apart at this level is the mental side. So um, I was putting the best and more into the mental side and, uh, you know, end up paying off. But, you know, I felt like I could have had the season I had um this past year, any any of my years, just physically, I I could have, but this year I was trusted more um, by the coaches, uh, trusted more by my quarterback. Trevor and I have a great relationship, um, and it was very sad to leave because you know we had we had very big plans for this upcoming year. He was like, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you to a thousand yards this year." So it was really sad to leave, and you know that speaks to the kind of guy he is because he's he's a he's a he's a not as just a great football player, but he's a great human being. Like I had him on my podcast and he was telling me, and I told the story of how when he first you know, signed to our team, he was calling everybody on the staff. And I tell you like the janitor, the, the training staff, you know what I mean? The people that clean the pools, you know, to see how they're yeah, doing yeah. and see them on a human level. So that just speaks to the kind of, you know, man he is. And we always got along great. You know what I mean? He, we always, you know, we're good friends and we still keep in contact to this day. So, it just it, it ended up you know bearing uh, like showing on the football field because of the relationship we have off the football field and uh, he's the kind of guy that wants to get everybody involved and when you're a receiver that's you know you want to feel like you're involved so that's probably the, the main reason why I had a breakout season like all those things combined just you know obviously being more mature um, having a quarterback like Trevor who you know really spreads the ball around so all, he's kind of similar to Masoli and Hamilton and uh, where you know everybody's getting love, um, that's that's probably the biggest factor why I had a, a breakout season. But if I could have told you that physically, I felt the same as every single season I played in the CFL. Yeah. Just mentally, I was a little bit more, you know, for the last three years, a little bit more sharp. <laughs> and it, it paid off because now you, I'm, I'm excited for you. You got a chance to play with the Argonauts again in your hometown Argos. And I know you you, you dubbed the uh, the Mississauga Mafia, you, Juwan, and Brissett, all you guys are together again. As, yeah. a, as an athlete, talk to me about, about how much it means to you to have a situation where you have all your friends together in one place and you're all on the same team together. Man, it's funny that you just mentioned them because I, I literally just saw them. And, uh, yeah, we're really actually friends, man. We're just friends. Even if it wasn't for football, we'd be friends. And yeah. uh, it's, it's a special thing when you can play with your friends. It almost reminds me of when you're, you know, a kid and you're playing high school football and, you know, you're all you're doing is playing with your friends, like guys you see all the time. Then you get to college and, you you know, you obviously have to make friends. And then the pros, like everybody's coming from all different walks of life. But it reminds me of like when you're a kid again and, you know, you're just you know you're out there balling with your friends and people that you care about. And it's special because at the pro level, you never, never, not never, but it's rare to get that opportunity. And now that we have it, man, we're, we're going to try to take, uh, full advantage of it. It's going to be really fun. And we're, I honestly couldn't be more excited to play with those guys because we know each other. We complement each other uh, so well. Uh, you know, it's a situation where, you know, the best receiving cores are the ones where no one cares, you know, who gets the credit, right? It's, it's all about, you know, the team game. It's all about everybody 
doing their job. You know, if I have to run 15 yards full speed so to get Juwan open, I don't care. You know, mm-hmm. you, you we're winning the game. But if then I know he'd do the same for me, right? So that's what it's all about right now with with us. Um, we're all excited. We're all from the same area, man, like Mississauga. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how rare is that? Like three receivers from the same – like me and uh, Dejan grew up five minutes from each other, right? And, yeah. uh, and Juwan is literally ten minutes away from us. So literally like, like four or five blocks away from each other, all, you know, friends and you know, on the same team and, and playing for each other. That's, that's yeah. special. I don't think you can get that anywhere. It's definitely, I don't, I don't remember any situation like that in the CFL prior where you had three guys in the same area playing for the same hometown team. It's, it's definitely right at the same position. Exactly. Exactly. And like you said, it, it comes down to, you know, not having an ego in those situations. And I think to have a successful football team, there's so many players on a football team that I think one bad ego can kind of ruin things. And you really need that whole team buy-in mindset of having, you know, the team is better than is the team is above, you know, any one individual and in, in having, again, that, that mindset that's put the ego inside and let's do it for the team. Even if the numbers aren't there, as long as I'm doing something to contribute to the team's win, that's all that matters at the end. A hundred percent. Before we uh, get to the last segment here of the podcast, how about you uh, shout out your podcast a bit? I know you got the all ball podcast up and running a couple episodes out. Tell the viewers a bit about where to reach it. What's the kind of the premise behind the podcast and, and everything like that. All right. So yeah, like you said, I've got a podcast. It's called the all ball podcast. And I really take, the listeners, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, and so what guys talk about in the locker room, fun stories, funny stories. I, I'm really here to entertain. Um, you know, it's a lot of times um, you ask great questions. You have a great angle. But I find that, you know, a lot of the questions that people ask are, you know, the same, right? Like, you know, I love your podcast because you got a unique take. Uh, you, you're talking about, you know, the athlete's mind. And, you know, a lot of people don't, don't get to see what's inside the athlete's mind. And my podcast is a little different. I like to you know, entertain, kind of see the humor in, in a lot of situations. I'll ask guys off base questions and, you know, see who the uh, how funniest way to DM a girl or, you know, just yeah. funny stuff that, you know, uh, you know, will happen in the course of a, you know, a, a guy's life or a guy's season or, you know, on game day. So I, I dive into a lot of things. It's really entertaining, really fun podcast. You can find it on Apple podcast, uh, Spotify podcast, um, uh, just, you know, follow me. I don't know if you'll put the link up on yeah, you know, yeah. social media and it's in my bio. Um, and it's really just, it's a fun time and, you know, just take people's mind off the, the coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, it's, it's nice to have a unique podcast out there. I see so many athletes out there coming out with podcasts and they're each so unique and it's pretty cool to see. Yeah. I think that's what makes a successful podcast and a good listen. So I'm, I'm excited for, I, I've listened to your episodes and, and they're really cool. And I'm excited for some of the guests you got on too. So that'll be pretty dope to hear too. Thank you. Appreciate that, brother. Before we wrap up here, I have a little segment here. I have 10, I have a collection of like 10 quotes about football and the mental side of football. And I'll yep. let you choose a number between one and 10. We'll do it a couple of times and I'll read you the quote. And I want you to kind of reflect on it a bit on your career and tell me what this quote means to you. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Do you got a number between one and ten? One and t- so give you a number between one and ten right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll choose the quote. Uh, I'll go with number three. Number three. This is a good one. This is uh, from Lou Holtz, legendary Notre Dame football coach. He said, "If what you did yesterday seems big, you haven't done anything today." Ooh, man, Lou Holtz is a legend, man. And but so that quote is, says a lot because it's always talking about looking forward and trying to outdo what you did yesterday. So if you're always thinking about what you did yesterday and you think that was big, chances are you're not going to, the motivation isn't going to be there tomorrow to try to outdo that. So you always got to try to outdo what you did yesterday. So that's big for me because that's all I've ever been about is just trying to outdo uh, what I did in the past. Like last year, you, you know, you said I had a breakout season. Well, uh, this year I'm trying to double that. And that's yep. the mindset each and every year. So I think that's what that uh, that quote kind of speaks towards. Always trying to uh, one up, one up yourself. And if you're always in competition with yourself, man, you can't lose. Yeah, kind of like the the cycle of life of an athlete, where you start off, quote unquote, at the bottom of the mountain, and you're working so hard to climb the mountain, right? And once you get to the top, as soon as you let your foot off the pedal, there's people coming up right behind you, right? They're just as hungry as you were five, ten years ago, and, and you really got to go full throttle every day as an athlete to stay at the top and and you know keep your place up there. A hundred percent. You have another number between one and 10? Mm, let's go seven. 
seven. This is um, one from Tom Brady. I, I'm almost going to say New England Patriots quarterback, but of course he's now at Tampa Bay. <laughs> Bro, for 20 years to, he is. And <laughs> still getting used to that one. He said, uh, if you don't believe in yourself, why is anyone else going to believe in you? Ooh, man, that is everything right there. That, you know, that self-belief is everything because it all starts with you. If I'm walking around telling everybody, man, I don't think I could do it. I don't, I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I'm good enough. Well, then I'm right, first of all. And secondly, how am I going to inspire any belief in, in, in myself if, I'm, if I don't even believe myself? So that's where it starts. Like, you see, you see some of the best athletes, man. They walk around like, like they're the man because you have to. You have to think you're the man You because if you don't, no one is going to think that. You think if you walk to the line, you got your head down, you know, you, you know, your, your, your chest is, 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 is squared and you're thinking that, you know, you're kind of scared. You think a DB is going to, is going to sense that and, 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 you know, take you out. He is, he's going to take you out. And sports is all about self-belief. You got to have that self-belief or you're not going anywhere. And chances are that everybody that has made it somewhere has some sense of self-belief because you have to. hundred percent, hundred percent agree with that. Last thing here, some couple uh, rapid fire questions for you. We've been in quarantine for a long time. I know you've been been uh, binge watching some shows. What's your favorite shows you got on lately? Ooh, obviously the guy go with the last dance. That's the last thing yeah, I've, yeah. I've watched. Man, that was phenomenal. Um, Ozark was really good too. Um, those two shows I say was have been uh, ruling my my uh, the lockdown period. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's it for me. I. But since I've been working on this podcast, I got to say, I haven't had a lot of time <laughs> Same, to be watching man. a bunch of shows. Yeah, you know how it is. Yeah, so uh, if it's not planning for the podcast, man, it's, it's, it's sleeping. So it's, it's, like, uh, uh, it's like being an athlete, like how we said, where you see on TV the catch. You don't see all the things behind the scenes. Same thing uh-huh. with a podcast. People will see the 30, 40-minute episode. They don't see the planning, the editing, the audio equipment, and everything like that, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Same, same thing. Yeah, what's uh, what's what's one tough matchup that you've had in the CFL that really sticks out to you? One DB that that you really look forward going up against? Well, I don't look forward to going. You you probably <laughs> you probably uh, will like this answer, but I remember I was a, my rookie year, man. Delvin Bro, yeah, this was yeah. before he went to the NFL. Man, I've never faced a DB as strong as that guy. I think there was a couple of times where I wasn't even running a route. I was running. I was just clearing out. But he he took one arm and 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 shoved me onto the sideline. Now I look back, I'm like, what just happened? Mm-hmm. Right? So it, it, that dude, I, ever since then, I had the ultimate respect for him. You know when you line up against him, you have to bring your A game, you have to bring your A releases because he will embarrass you if you don't. So um, that's, that's I, I like, I don't look forward to going against him. Are you crazy? Yeah, that, yeah. Guy's, <laughs> that guy's one of a kind. But honestly, he's, he's, a, he's a great DB. Yeah. Uh, much respect to him. Last one here. You can't you can't answer Argos or, or Eskies for this one. But what's your favorite CFL jersey? Ooh, that is a great question. Uh, no Argos or Eskies. Looking across the board. Mm. You know that Hamilton black looks nice. I'll just throw that out there. I, I you know what you said? No Argos or uh, Edmonton, right? But yeah. the Argos are rivals to Hamilton. I can't <laughs> choose them, but Hamilton's out. Um, they do have a nice combo, but uh, I can't choose them. I, I think I might go with the the blue the blue of Winnipeg like, yeah. with the gold. That's just a nice, that's nice. combo, man. That's a sweet combo. So it's a little, it's a little retro with, as well. It's kind of got that yeah. retro vibes to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'll go thing. with that. Yeah. Hey, anyways, man, I appreciate you taking some time today. Again, hope that you, your family, all your friends are are staying safe and healthy. I know. Um, CFL season is a little unclear. I don't know if we're going to get a Labor Day Classic this year, but I'm looking forward to seeing a Labor Day Classic in years to come and excited for you because, again, I know how much the uh, season will mean to you playing for your hometown Argos again. I appreciate that, man. And same to you, man. Hope, uh, you know, your family and your friends are doing well and, and you're doing a fantastic job with this podcast, man. I enjoy it. Appreciate it, man. I enjoy your podcast as well and um, I'm excited to listen to the future episodes again, like I said. All right. Thanks, brother. Oh, man. Take care, man. All right. Talk to you soon. Yep.